Okay, so for those of you that don't know, the uh, M2 started their ob guide block today. So today is our first official day of women's health. Um, and it felt fitting to bring on an expert both in her field in obstetrics and gynecology and also in the um, health impacts of what has been happening in Palestine and Gaza. Um, and so without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Alice. Rothschild, who is an accomplished filmmaker, an author, um, and a wonderful physician. She's retired now, um, so she's also taken on the role of grandmother, from what I heard earlier. <laughs> um, but we wanted to thank you so much for coming, and the floor is yours. You have the full two hours. Please uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to start out um, sharing my screen. Okay. I can make it do this. And let me figure out how to minimize this. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna be talking about healthcare in Gaza. And um, I wanna just say that I do have multiple identities as you've learned. Um, I am an OBGYN now retired, uh, did that for almost 40 years. And I've also uh, become a human rights activist and a writer and a filmmaker. And I work in solidarity in this particular conflict situation. And I think um, it would be maybe helpful for people to know my journey from doctor to activist author. Um, I got involved in doing health and human rights uh, delegations to Israel-Palestine uh, with a small group of people in Boston in 2003. So I've been to the region almost annually uh, up until this uh, year, except for the pandemic. So I was last in Gaza and uh, the West Bank and Israel in August of last year, just before the assault. And I saw my job as uh, not only being a doctor, but bearing witness and writing both uh, um, to be useful and also as an act of co-resistance. And if anyone's uh, interested, um, the books that I've written are Broken Promises, Broken Dreams, which is basically the story of my journey and the Israelis and Palestinians who taught me what I now know. And then On the Brink, which was a collection of blogs right before the 2014 invasion. And then Condition Critical, uh, which also um, is a lot of on the ground reporting with analysis. So that's probably the best book to read if you're interested in the focusing in on health and human rights. And then in the last couple of years, I've become much more aware of the lack of Palestine in children's literature. So last year, I published a, a book called Finding Melody Sullivan, which is a stealth Palestine book. It's actually about a young woman in Palestine. And uh, just a few weeks ago, Old Enough to Know came out, which is a middle grade novel, again, about Palestine. So I'm trying to broaden the conversation uh, with folks who don't usually hear about Palestine. And in the course of all of this, I also made a documentary film which is available on Vimeo uh, called Voices Across the Divide, where I interviewed Palestinians who lived through pre-1948, 48, life after 48, 67, all the different major events. And then I put together the history of the region uh, through their stories. So it's very personal. So um, as I've said, I provide care, I do interviews, document, and try to tell the story. And what I found is, um, that Palestinians uh, who are very oppressed in under occupation, they're not people who need a voice. People talk about giving a voice to the voiceless. They've got plenty of voices. What they need is a microphone. And so I see myself as being part of the microphone. And I've worked with a lot of different organizations there, uh, Physicians for Human Rights Israel, B'Tselem, which is a human rights organization, Adala, which is uh, what we call the Israeli NAACP, um, as well as Palestinian Medical Relief Society and UNRWA, which is a UN organization. And um, I've been very involved with the Gaza Community Mental Health Program and also been to conferences about torture with the uh, Treatment and Rehabilitation Center for Victims of Torture, have interviewed people from Adamir, which is a prison rights group, have uh, worked with women's groups in Gaza, and there's a whole bunch of others that I've had uh, experience with. So the thing that becomes quite apparent is that healthcare is provided in the context of siege, checkpoints, closures, curfews, a strict permitting system that controls who can leave and who can stay, bypass roads if you're on the West Bank, and the separation wall or apartheid wall, uh, Israeli incursions, massive assaults, uh, frequent detentions, and factual violence. So that's the social political scene uh, that healthcare is provided in. And so there are many ethical questions to think about 
when you think about health. Um, and so I want you to be thinking about these things as you see my slides. Uh, one of them is international law, and I'll talk more about that. Um, the impact of collective civilian punishment and restrictions of access. Um, the impact of ghettoization of an entire population. Incarceration, mass incarceration, especially involving children and the proportionality in war. And as I've said, healthcare and healing occur in a socio-political context. So I would like to you to think about the fact that political solutions are needed to health and human rights issues because healthcare occurs in a political context. And if you're trying to sort of figure out why do we should be interested, um, I think it's important to ask why is life expectancy in Israel 10 years more than in the West Bank and Gaza? Why is maternal mortality nine to 10 times greater in the occupied territories than in Israel? So uh, a number of uh, human rights organizations have over the last couple of years uh, come out with statements that say that the uh, behavior of the Israeli government is uh, equivalent to apartheid and sometimes war crimes. And this was a statement from Beth Selem, which is an Israeli human rights organization. And what they said is a regime that uses laws, practices, and organized violence to establish and maintain the supremacy of one group over another is an apartheid regime. The accumulation of measures which receive public and judicial support and are enshrined in both practice and law points to the conclusion that the bar for divining Israel as an apartheid regime has been met. And this is important because it's important to understand the situation, but also because there is medical apartheid. And this became very clear at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. I uh, curated a weekly health update on COVID for several years. So I saw this whole rollout. And basically the Oslo Accords set up the Palestinian Authority in 1994 to set up and maintain a healthcare system. Uh, but the Oslo Accords is predated by the Geneva Accords, which mandate that occupying powers have the responsibility to combat the spread of contagious diseases and epidemics in the territories. So during uh, the beginnings of the pandemic and the few years after that, the Israeli government wanted Palestinians in the territories to have the responsibilities of sovereignty, providing healthcare, dealing with the pandemic, without the benefits of sovereignty, having resources and control over the system. So one's response to the pandemic totally depended on your geographic, ethnic, and political status. And I'm gonna read the, this slide uh, because it is the take home message if you don't remember anything else. Um, more than 75 years of uh, domination, Israeli domination and dispossession has affected Palestinian life through occupation, siege, annexation, de-development and permanent displacement of refugees, severely impacting the ability of Palestinians to access the essential building blocks of health the fragmentation of society and destruction of the ability and opportunity to create essential institutions involved in healthcare has created a reality that is recognized today as medical apartheid. Two separate systems, two separate realities. And as I've mentioned, we can see this in terms of health disparities in life expectancy and maternal and infant mortality. And one of the ways that this happens is through an active policy of de-development of the healthcare system. So the Israeli government, uh, when pertaining to Gaza, does not allow uh, institutions to grow, have the ability to build new buildings, import equipment uh, for staff to get training outside of the strip. And so what's happened is that that um, produces um, a de-development rather than a development of the healthcare system. They also do this through strict medical permits. Uh, so uh, the fact that high level care is um, particularly related to certain diseases like cancer are not available in Gaza. People have to apply for permits to leave and then to go either to Israel or the West Bank or Jordan, wherever they're going. And it is a very bureaucratic situation and um, they're very strict and limiting on the number of people they allowed out. And as, as I've mentioned, there's a chronic severe shortage of medications and equipment related to the siege. Then there are direct attacks on healthcare facilities and a high level of conflict related trauma. I also just wanna put this up front, uh, thinking about the impact of Zionism and medicine. Um, <clears throat> In 2018, the nation state bill was passed by the Israeli Knesset, 
which officially legally privileged Jewish citizens of Israel over Palestinians. And so there is a form of legal institutional racism within uh, Israel. And so the question we have to ask is, are Jewish Israeli clinicians able to see Palestinian citizens of Israel or Palestinians in the occupied territories as fellow equal human beings? And I would like you to just note that last November, there were 100 Israeli doctors that approved the bombing of Gaza hospitals. So I'm gonna talk about health and the right to health in its broadest sense. And I'm using a definition from Physicians for Human Rights Israel. Uh, so they uh, define this as freedom of movement and access to health services. And then all the things that make up a healthy society, clean water, modern sanitation, adequate nutrition, adequate housing and education, uh, good employment levels, and the ability to live in a nonviolent society. And if you look at the picture on the right, this is a patient education pamphlet from Palestinian Medical Relief Society. So when you're pregnant, you get pamphlets about taking your vitamins and breastfeeding your baby, but you also get a pamphlet about what to do if you're stuck in labor at a checkpoint. Now, I keep mentioning international law, and I wanted to um, describe that a little more clearly. Um, international humanitarian law was codified uh, in the four Geneva Conventions in 1949, which basically outlined the protection of civilians in times of war and treats um, uh, war crimes as defined as murder of civilians, torture, rape, and hostage taking. So this is part of international law and a body of rules that govern relations between states that sign on to this. There have been since then additional protocols relating to the protection of victims of armed conflicts and multiple other agreements that prohibit certain kinds of weapons, military tactics, protect certain categories of people and goods. And then in 2000, there was the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, about how children should be treated in armed conflict. Now, healthcare in Palestine has been described in the Lancet as fragmented and incoherent. So in 1994, as I mentioned, um, the Ministry of Health was established. This was after Oslo, and their job was to set up a healthcare system and run it. Um, in 1950, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, was established to provide care as well as education and shelter to Palestinian refugees. So in Gaza, there are eight very crowded, poverty-stricken refugee camps. And in the West Bank, there are 23 camps. And healthcare is provided by UNRWA for these people. Then we have a host of non-governmental organizations like Palestinian Medical Relief Society. And then we have private providers. And then we have the role of the Israeli government in de-development. And for Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and in Israel, they're in a totally different uh, ballpark. Uh, they are able to use the five HMOs and private care that are available to Israeli Jews as well. Now, just some brief facts about occupation. In the West Bank, there are between four and 500 checkpoints that you have to go through to get from point A to point B, and often you have to have permits to do that. And the permitting system is very strict. Since 2002, uh, there has been the building of a separation or apartheid wall. 85% of it is built in the West Bank on Palestinian land. And the location of the wall, which looks like a wiggling snake, is basically designed to have um, the Jewish settlements on the Israeli side of the wall as much as possible. And um, there are about 10,000 Palestinians that are trapped between what is called the Green Line, the Armistice Line from 1948, and the Separation Wall. And they're stuck. They can't go into Israel, but they have great difficulty getting into the West Bank. Then there are about 500 miles of bypass roads that you have to have an Israeli license plate to be on. So this is basically roads for the settlers in the West Bank. And there are some 800,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem neighborhoods. Thousands of Palestinian homes have been demolished and olive trees uprooted. And Palestinian residents live under Israeli military rule, which is different than their Jewish neighbors. Um, and under military rule, uh, Palestinians that are tried in the Israeli military courts are found guilty 99.74% of the time. In Gaza, just some historical facts. Gaza was occupied in 1967 after the 67 war. Um, Israeli settlers moved in, uh, were encouraged to move in, and then they were withdrawn in 2005. In 2006, in an election that Jimmy Carter certified as 
democratic and honest. Hamas won the elect a legislative election and their uh, campaign was for clean government. It was not for driving Israelis into the sea. It was cleaning up the corruption of the Fatah party. Uh, then a civil war ensued between Hamas and Fatah, and Fatah was partially funded by the U.S. Hamas won in Gaza, and the international community, led by the U.S. and Israel, began a severe siege. Since that time, there have been multiple um, incursions and uh, severe Israeli assaults, uh, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2021, 2022, and now one that started on October 7th and is ongoing. In 2018 to 2019, there were weekly, uh, mostly peaceful demonstrations called the Great March of Return along the perimeter fence uh, that um, the protesters were largely met with uh, Israeli snipers who uh, had um, a policy of shooting uh, mostly at the legs. So there was a massive amount of orthopedic injuries from um, these weekly marches. Um, and so you can picture the level of stress on the healthcare system. Now, um, I was asked to focus on women. There are many challenges for women. Um, women have different experiences depending on their socioeconomics, whether they're in urban settings, which are often more liberal-minded and rural settings that are often more conservative. Um, it is uh, a culture that has a tendency towards early marriage, particularly um, when families are very poor. And it is a culture that expects large families children are uh, celebrated and women are primarily responsible for the children. Um, in much of the region, there are some very conservative attitudes towards women, towards their roles, although there are women, you know, more than half the women in half the university students are women. Um, and the attitudes towards LGBTQI folks are also pretty conservative. Uh, there is a tremendous stigma for women as well as men regarding uh, mental health issues. Uh, so that's a whole nother uh, problem in terms of dealing with them. And there are high levels of poverty due to occupation and siege. As often happens in very stressed cultures, there is a level of gender-based violence. And I've studied this um, and it's often related to uh, men who've been spent years in prison, are very traumatized, come back, are unable to find employment, and take out their rage on their wives. Uh, within the society, there is also some racism within Palestinian society because if you look at Palestinians, they can be blonde and blue eyed and they can look very African. Uh, Palestine was a crossroads and so everybody left a little genetic potential there. And so within, for instance, in Gaza, there are a lot of Afro-Palestinians and they are of less status than the whiter Palestinians. Women, as I've mentioned, are highly educated, but there is little employment for them. Another challenge is that they live under occupation and siege. They're dealing with a tremendous amount of loss and trauma, and they're the strength of the family that keeps everybody together. When they seek healthcare, because of the lack of updating from uh, of providers and the lack of funding for healthcare, the range of skills of providers is all over the place. There was also difficulties in access, as I've mentioned, and this is particularly problematic for women with breast cancer because there are no radioisotopes or radiotherapeutics in Gaza, and so they have to get permits and they often get denied and all that kind of stuff. And then there's the question of who's funding their health care. If they're a refugee, the funding is through UNRWA. Now, once you actually get to uh, a clinician, uh, decision making is very different uh, because you have to think about what does it take for me to go get that test? Should I uh, go to the surgeon and just have the lump removed? Should I do this? Should I do that? Because there are all sorts of barriers in the West Bank, it's checkpoints. In Gaza, it's more related to uh, the level of uh, war going on or assaults. And so um, all in all, there's a tremendous lack of screening, diagnostic and therapeutic options, very few mammograms. And so women, let's say who have breast cancer are often diagnosed at a fairly advanced stage. And the only thing that doctors there can offer them is a total mastectomy. And um, as I've mentioned, there's a tremendous uh, challenge to get uh, permits for high level care. I've also mentioned that women are incredibly strong in this society. They're the main cohesive force within a family. They are highly valued. I was actually in Gaza on Mother's Day and it was just a mind blowing experience. Um, and women tend to live in multi-generational situations with tremendous amount of connections between relatives and a lot of support. They're famous for their samud, which means uh, persistence and patience. 
as I said, they tend to be well educated and they tend to great take great pride in their children and in cooking well um, and uh, have a sort of joy and love of life that is kind of astonishing given the level of oppression that they live under. Now, I'm just going to have one slide on my personal observations um, about providing care. It's a bit of a blend of first world and third world. So I'll give you some examples. Um, I was in al Alakhli Hospital in Hebron uh, observing a C-section. And the OR standards, the technique, the use of general anesthesia, because they have no epidurals, was very third world, as far as I could tell. I also went to a Ministry of Health hospital where the delivery room was three delivery tables all in a row. The women delivered, you know, screaming next to each other with their legs up in stirrups. It was very non-first world. And then I went to a birth center in Mythalum, which is also in the West Bank, that could have been a birth center in the U.S. So there was this whole span of different levels of sophistication, care, modernization, et cetera, et cetera. Patients tend to find that there is minimal time with clinicians, especially in the UNRWA clinics. I've heard doctors seeing 50, 60 patients an hour, um, uh, I mean, a day. Um, and um, uh, it's because of the lack of funding and the lack of staff. If you look at maternal mortality in Gaza, uh, one reference I saw found that 50% of the women who died bled to death and 25% died of sepsis. This is very different than in the West Bank where a third died of pulmonary embolism and 23% from preeclampsia. So the deaths in Gaza were more third world kind of deaths and the deaths in the West Bank reflected um, a more uh, higher level of quality of care. And so you see the inequalities between Gaza and the West Bank. In terms of GYN, I found that women tend to have minimal knowledge about their bodies, especially prior to marriage. Um, contraception is used uh, for spacing. Um, and IUDs are the most popular because you can put it in and then you don't have to go back until you want to take it out. I found the expectations for exams were very complicated because there's a tremendous amount of modesty. I often spent 15 minutes trying to convince a woman that I should do a pelvic exam. And everyone expects an ultrasound, whether they come for yeast infection or a pelvic mass or whatever. So it was a little um, different um, than one would expect in a first world setting. Women suffer from a lack of exercise because of their uh, living situations. They've had major dietary changes with the loss of agricultural land and this extreme dependence on neoliberal Israeli policies and food imports because Israel, Israeli government decides what foods get out and what foods get in. And they also have to deal uh, with the shame of gender-based violence and uh, the uh, not a very good ability to deal with rape and issues of family honor. So looking at the Gaza Strip, um, if you look at the left upper, you can see that uh, you see Israel with the West Bank being that kidney bean shape. And then there's Egypt to the south, Jordan to the east, and more north is Syria and Lebanon. And the Gaza Strip is that little black line. So if we blow up the Gaza Strip, in the north, there's a broader crossing called Erez, which is where people like me go in and out. It's a big military terminal, a pretty scary place. And in the south is Rafah, which is the border with Egypt. And that's where Gazans are trying to get out and where much of the gate is trying to get in. Um, Gaza is uh, six miles by 28 miles long. It's a really tiny place. And if you put it on the state of Massachusetts, you can see that it's just a teeny little line. So you can imagine how small the strip actually is. Now I've been on four uh, delegations starting in 2005 and the last time was last August. Um, each time I travel with a, um, some kind of NGO and I've been invited each time by the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. So you have to, it, you have to go through tremendous hoops to get a permit to get in and off, most often it doesn't get granted. So over the course of the years, I have done direct services, women's empowerment, multiple interviews and documenting, blogging, that kind of thing. And then I work with a bunch of groups that have some focus on Gaza. Now, when I was there in August, there were around 18,000 uh, Gazans working in Israel um, and they, were, um, they had what are called economic-based permits. These permits do not cover work-related injury or death and they have no health insurance when they're in Israel. Um, so when they get injured in their high risk agricultural and um, building trades and construction work that they are allowed to do, uh, then they get dumped back in Gaza where there's often not the equipment and the expertise that they need. I saw child beggars on the street for the first time in my life, heard reports of men selling their kidneys to feed their families and families being unable to afford olive oil, which is like the staff of life there. 
There was a report that came out in that August um, from the UN that exit permits were 88% below the monthly average in 2000. And the ma majority, vast majority of them were for the work-related permits that I've mentioned. So that only 6% of the exits were by patients who were referred for medical treatment. And 19% um, of the applications were not approved on time. So you imagine you're one of the sickest people, you need high level care, you go through the bureaucratic nightmare of getting the permit and then it comes late and it's just terrible. Now, pre the 2023 aggression, there were 13 governmental hospitals and then there were 142 primary healthcare centers uh, run by the Ministry of Health, UNRWA and NGOs. There were approximately 40 private hospitals, two medical schools, and then a bunch of professional schools. But there's a real disconnect between the staff that is available and the jobs that are available. So there are 120 nursing positions open each year, meaning they have funding. Uh, it's not related to need. And there are 5,000 nursing students in Gaza. There are less than 20 psychiatrists in Gaza, and less than seven of them are doctors. So one of the big health issues before the assault was the lack of electricity, often four to eight hours a day at not predictable times. Um, there were major fuel shortages and the fuel is largely used to run electricity generators when there's no electricity. And some hospitals actually closed due to fuel shortages. There were severe restrictions on permits to leave, as I mentioned, severe shortages of critical medicine and equipment, and then a lack of specialists because doctors cannot get out of the strip to get specialty training very easily. The medical personnel were beyond exhausted. Many of them were going with unpaid salaries because of the fight between Israel and the PA about collecting taxes and then giving the money that was collected for the PA to the Palestinians. And then they had been pretty decimated by the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at UNRWA funding for refugees, this was completely slashed by Trump. It was partially restored by Biden. But right before the assault, UNRWA was threatening to cease operations due to the level of their budget crisis. And this was in the face of deepening poverty, rising malnutrition, and rising unemployment. And the Israeli siege not only controls everything that goes in and everything that comes out, they have other ways to make life miserable. Um, they have a um, policy or a practice of fumigating farmland with herbicides along the eastern perimeter fence. And, you know, killing the crops and making the land toxic. They have decimated the fishing industry, as you may imagine. Uh, Gaza is a coastal a plain and it was a fishing culture. And they've severely limited the fishing zone and they uh, repeatedly attack fishermen, shoot at them, shoot at their boats. Um, it's just a very dangerous situation. Um, and then there is the potential flooding of crops. So the most um, fertile area is along the eastern perimeter fence. And oftentimes the Israelis, just before harvest, when the crops are just about ready, will flood these fields and destroy the crops. And then you have 2.3 million Gazans and 50% of them are under 18. It's a very young population. Now, um, I put the slide together on the 19th, which was day 103 of the assault. Um, and what we are seeing is a total disintegration of the healthcare system. So there are now over 25,000 people who have been killed in Gaza, 60, over 62,000 injured. Um, when the Hamas attack happened, there were 1,162 people that were killed. Um, in Gaza fighting, uh, 191 Israeli Defense Force soldiers have been killed and 1,178 have been injured. It's thought that there are about 136 hostages in Gaza. And this is all true because the Israeli airstrikes have been on homes, civilian gatherings, markets, houses of worship, bakeries, restaurants, hospitals, healthcare facilities, ambulances, and then there's a full electricity blackout and no fuel. So at this point in Gaza, more than two thirds of the hospitals are not functioning and the rest are only partially functioning. Um, something over 60% of the housing units have been destroyed or damaged, and 75% of the population, 1.7 million people, are now internally displaced. And so you may remember that the Israeli military told people in the north to move south, which many people did. 
So much of the population now is in the south. Um, I think Rafah, which was not a very big city now, has something like a million people in it. And these people are sheltering in UNRWA uh, schools and churches um, on the street and uh, tents, it's just really disastrous. There are severe shortages of water, clean water and medicine, and a real risk of famine and starvation. And by risk, I mean there are people already that are living under famine conditions, and there are people already who are starving, um, and that's only going to get worse. And with these increased tensions um, intracommunally, there is more gender-based violence. Um, and then um, in the midst of all of this population, there's about 50,000 pregnant women. Now, what we see is deliberate Israeli attacks also uh, on healthcare personnel. So 337 personnel have been killed, 121 ambulances have been destroyed, 152 UN staff have been killed, and this results in uh, you know, more than two thirds of the hospitals and health centers being unable to function, partly due to the lack of staff, due to strikes and the lack of fuel. There have been zero, no medical permits to the West Bank or Israel. There have been um, major unusual burns seen on dead and wounded patients, raising the question of whether Israel the military is using white phosphorus, which is a um, military weapon that is prohibited in urban areas. And you also must remember that women have almost no menstrual or hygiene products, which is pretty disastrous. Um, as you may imagine, this has a massive impact on mental health. It affects everyone, young and old. Uh, there was a report that children were developing increasing levels of convulsions from stress, increasing levels of bedwetting, which was already a common issue in Gaza as a um, fear response. Um, women, uh, kids are much more fearful. They're engaging in aggressive behavior and nervousness, and some kids are refusing to leave their parents' sides. UNICEF has now said that Gaza is the most dangerous place in the world to be a child. If you look at uh, the aid that's coming in, uh, there are two crossings, the Rafah crossing in the south, which, which was with Egypt, and then the Karam Shalom crossing, which is along the eastern perimeter in the south, um, that's with Israel. And there have been some trucks carrying food and water and medical supplies and rarely fuel uh, that have gotten in. This is pretty intermittent and way, 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 way below the numbers needed. There has been a telecom blackout since the 18th, and recently uh, the Israeli Defense Force destroyed Al Isra University, which was the last remaining university in Gaza. So there's been a systematic destruction of all of the universities. Now, if you look at the issue of water, there are waters uh, that's trucked in, there's water from the functional desalitation plant, and there's been water from one of the three main water supply lines from Israel that was restored on the 30th of December. And putting all of these resources in together, this has yielded 7% of the water that's needed to grow the Gaza population. So you can just imagine um, the situation where people are bathing in the sea, um, they're using water from the sea, they're drinking contaminated and toxic water. Most sewage pumping stations are not operational. All five wastewater treatment plants have been shut down. So raw sewage is continuously dumped into the sea. Winter has arrived and with that cold rainy weather and it's a very kind of bitey kind of cold. And this has resulted in flooding and some areas where there is actual sewage in the streets. And as you may imagine, chickenpox, scabies, the diarrheal diseases, the respiratory illnesses and hepatitis A are significantly increasing because the hygiene is just horrific. Um, they talk about, you know, 500 people using one toilet kind of hygiene. There are 6,200 people waiting who are very injured, who uh, need transfer for treatment abroad. And there are over 10,000 cancer patients who are at risk for death because they are not receiving their cancer treatments. Um, recently, we've also seen an increase in the denial by the Israeli military for humanitarian missions, particularly in the north. Uh, there is increased concern about the high risk of explosive ordnance and unexploded ordnance um, because there's uh, been so much uh, bombing that has gone on. Um, a couple of weeks ago, it was said that it was equivalent, the bombing level was equivalent to two atomic bombs. And then while all of this is going on, Palestinian armed groups continue their indiscriminate rocket fire into Israel and on the ground fighting, and the civilians are trapped 
in the midst of this gigantic catastrophe. Um, there's now more talk of describing this as a genocide and a series of war crimes. Um, looking at, I don't want you to forget the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, there have been multiple Israeli attacks on Janine, Tilkarm, and Nablus, all in the West Bank. There has been instances of obstruction of ambulances, which is a longstanding thing that's happened, but it's happening a lot. And there have been waves of Palestinian resistance and arrests and detentions. Um, 388, uh, at least, uh, Palestinians have been killed. Many of them have been killed by armed settlers and over 400 Israeli settler attacks, especially in area C. And so what's happened with the new, uh, very more right-wing government than even in the past is that they have basically unleashed the most rabid uh, fascistic side of the Israeli settler movement. Area C is the 65% of the West Bank that is totally controlled by the Israeli military. And so the settlers are engaged in land seizures, setting up illegal outposts, and the Israeli government has had a mass distribution of guns and the settlers have made use of that. There has also been a 60% increase in home demolitions in East Jerusalem. So this is all part of an attempt to drive Palestinians out. Now, I want to talk about the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, which is a, an incredible group that has uh, been my uh, sort of an invitation to Gaza. Um, this opened, uh, this uh, particular building um, opened in 1990, um, and the Gaza Community Health Program has uh, three centers, or had three centers, and five mobile clinics. Um, this is a picture I took. Um, and they do a tremendous amount of training of mental health workers, a direct care for mental health, provide medications, a lot of community education. They work a lot on reducing social stigma because that is a cultural issue and they have had a telephone hotline. Their main focus has been on women, children and prisoners and on chronic traumatic stress disorder. Because as you may imagine, there is no post-traumatic stress disorder in Gaza because no one ever gets to the post phase. And one of the things that's very impressive about them is that their interventions are very evidence-based and modern. Now, what I know about this particular building, which was their main building, is that we're massive bombing around it. The roads are all cratered, the windows were blown out, but I cannot find anyone who knows if it's still standing. All the centers are now closed. The hotline is barely functional because of the lack of electricity and people can't use their phones. Patients were given the um, phone numbers of their therapist, but they can't reach them. Um, patients used to get free medications and now they have to buy their own meds and the meds aren't even available. So this is a catastrophe. And the other catastrophe is that the staff of the center are in the same boat. They're equally traumatized as their patients. So it puts an added stress on uh, the provision of mental health. Now, I was also asked to do a focus on pregnant women. Uh, this is a picture that occurred in the New York Times um, in Al Shifa Hospital when there was no electricity and the incubators weren't working. So they took all the uh, NICU babies and they lined them all up and wrapped them up and tried to see if they could keep each other warm through their body heat. There are 5,500 approximately births per month. Most of these women are having zero, no prenatal care, and many of them are internally displaced. Um, I suggest that um, I had an op-ed in the New York Times about two weeks ago and had uh, highlighted um, a woman with uh, diabetes who was pregnant and she had moved, she's a dentist, and she had moved five times and you know was unable to get insulin and had no prenatal care. These women also have very little idea of where they will deliver. If there is a functioning hospital, you take your life into your own hands, getting there. And when you get there, it's unclear whether they'll be able to take care of you. Um, there are about 180 women a day giving birth, again, without adequate care. There have been reports of women undergoing cesarean sections without anesthesia. Um, there are reports of women delivering and within three hours being uh, discharged because they need the beds. Um, and it's estimated that about 15% of the pregnancies um, and deliveries are high risk. So women these days are giving birth in shelters, in their homes, and you've got to remember their homes also have, you know, their 40 relatives who fled from someplace else. Uh, they're giving birth in the streets, amid rubble, in overwhelmed healthcare facilities, in tents, and the sanitation is just appalling. So the risk of infection and medical complications is on the rise, and there's a severe lack of antibiotics. Um, the lack of food and clean water 
and the rising starvation and dehydration that I've mentioned are particularly serious for pregnant women because they are a very vulnerable population and the health of the mother and the baby totally depend on adequate nutrition and clean water. And uh, so all of these have impacts on health. They also have impacts on the ability of the mother to bond and to breastfeed. And you can imagine a starving, dehydrated, stressed out mother may have difficulties breastfeeding. And if she needs formula, then she needs to get the powder and then she needs to mix it with water and there's no clean water. So this is just an ongoing catastrophe. And oftentimes when women come in, the facilities are overwhelmed with wounded people. So she's sort of competing for attention with people who have severe wounds. So we're expecting a big rise in maternal deaths. No one has collected that information as yet. Um, there's also a psychological toll from the hostilities. Um, and sometimes uh, the toll is pretty deadly. Um, we've seen a uh, consequences on reproductive health, including a recently documented 300% rise in stress-induced miscarriages and rising numbers of congenital abnormalities, stillbirths, and premature births. And as you may imagine, uh, these, this kind of level of trauma and level of disease and uh, level of mental health catastrophe has a multi-generational component. Everybody's not gonna be better the moment the uh, ceasefire comes. Now, as I mentioned, um, there has been talk of the crime of genocide and uh, South Africa has recently presented an 84 page complaint to the International Criminal Court accusing Israel of quote, a calculated pattern of conduct indicating a genocidal intent. And they cite language that supports intent and the facts of the assault. Now the crime of genocide was outlined in 1948 with the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So genocide is defined as specific acts committed with the intent to destroy, quote, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. <laughs> acts include killing members of the group and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. There was also, uh, I believe it was last week, a very interesting article in The Guardian looking at um, the longstanding policies by successive US governments that have uh, worked to shield Israel from US laws such as the Leahy Law, which are supposed to prevent US funding of human rights abuses abroad. And so there was a policy of not applying these rules to Israel. And when I've talked with my um, U.S. representative, he always says, well, there's the Leahy law, you don't have to worry. Well, the Leahy law has not applied to, has been applied to Israel. Um, this a whole conflict is incredibly dangerous uh, in terms of a wider regional war. And just, you know, taking a quick uh, thumbnail look at what's going on, the Yemeni Iran backed Houthis are attacking ships in the Red Sea. The US and the UK are responding. This is a picture actually of um, a helicopter attack on a cargo ship. Um, Israel has done attacks in Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah has done drone attacks in Israel. Israel has done attacks in Syria. Um, Iran has struck the Islamic State in Syria. The US has struck Iran-linked forces in Iraq. I mean, this is just a powder keg waiting to blow up and cause an immense amount of catastrophe. And all these nations have been very well armed. Um, so I think when you sort of step back and look at the big, big picture, we're looking at structural racism, apartheid, cross-generational trauma, and what appears to be a revenge. Um, we see uh, Israeli reliance on military solutions to political problems. We see what appears to be an utter disregard for the health and lives of Palestinian people who clearly matter less than their Jewish cohorts in the eyes of the Israeli government. And the Israeli government keeps saying, we're protecting civilians, we warn them, but the facts speak for themselves. If tens of thousands of people are dead and injured, there is no uh, ability to protect civilians. And sometimes um, the Israeli government has uh, given uh, uh, gifts or you know, medical uh, equipment or that kind of thing. And they always feel so uh, as pious doing this and uh, uh, see this as examples of Israeli largesse and generosity because they do uh, humanitarian work in other places in the world. But it's important to remember that Israel is the occupying power and they are actually responsible for the health and well-being of the people they occupy. The other thing I want you to think about is the difference between humanitarian pauses 
and ceasefire. There's been you know, one humanitarian pause and some very uh, weak-willed people calling for it. And basically what that means is that there's like a week when people can crawl out of their shelters, try to scurry around and get some food and water. And then the, as soon as it's over, the bombing starts again. You know, A ceasefire means that the bombing will stop and Hamas will stop attacking Israel. So I think that, again, we're doing big picture here. The crux of the problem is that the status quo can only continue if we as human beings see Jews as more human, more deserving, more innocent and honorable than Palestinian Arabs. If we as a community are blind to Arab suffering and the history of settler colonialism. And so the fundamental issues include racism, which potentially leads to ethnic cleansing and genocide. And what we can see is that the health of Palestinians is intrinsically linked to their liberation and end to the siege. And I'm just, I'm gonna uh, stop the share and I want to um, read um, a poem written by a young Gazan writer uh, from a group that I work with called We Are Not Numbers. And this is an organization that was started in 2014 after the 2014 Israeli assault. And what we do is we um, mentor Gazans 18 to 30 to be able to tell their story and to write in good English and to learn how to be a good journalist and to learn how to express themselves in English to a Western audience. So this poem is by Ahmed Dremley. He's a young man who uh, is from Gaza City. I don't honestly know. I doubt that he's still in Gaza City. I don't know where he is. And during the bombing, um, Israel killed his best friend, nine of his cousins, an uncle, other friends and family members are still under the rubble and no one knows where they are. And this was a poem that he wrote for the website, We Are Not Numbers. I'm still breathing, but that is not enough to feel alive. I lost my loved ones. I lost my power, hope, dreams, and my last tears. Nothing can express the pain of losing the people who were a main part of my life. Nothing can erase the last look at them from my eyes. Nothing can stop replaying our memories before Israel took them away. And nothing can let me imagine moving forward with my life after them. Thank you. So I think we're gonna open this up to questions now. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Rothschild. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, all of you have access to unmute, feel free to do so. If you wanna open your cameras, also feel free to do so, or you can simply put it in the chat and we can relay the questions to Dr. Rothschild on your behalf. Hi, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Julia. Okay, cool. Um, my name is Julia. I'm an M4 at Cooper, also going into OBGYN. Thank you for this talk. It was incredible. I appreciate all the work you've been doing there. Um, I'm curious if there's any um, active efforts to make medical trips to Gaza. And if not, like, what do you see as, like, if you have to triage these patients, you know, like, where do we rebuild when we're, like, want to... Um, uh, like, where do we start with addressing, like, the medical issues of female patients there when there's a breather, you know, that right. ever comes? Right. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different groups that are um, talking about organizing uh, medical you know, missions to go and work on the immense catastrophe that's going on. You know, I have a personal friend who was just there for two weeks with the International Rescue Committee, and they had to leave because they were being shelled in the hospital. Um, right now, it is almost impossible to get in and almost impossible to for outsiders to provide care on the inside, although there are a few people doing that. But it is very dangerous, and it is very hard to get in and to get you know, permits and all that kind of stuff. And you have to come with supplies because there is uh, a, such a devastating shortage of supplies. So although, you know, many of us feel like, oh, you know, we need to go and do something. Um, right now, it's really, really almost impossible to do that. And um, I would uh, just point out that the Jordanian government set up a field hospital. So there's this is on the government level. You know, they're communicating with the Israeli Defense Force. Um, this is all, you know, on the up and up. And they set up a field hospital in the south and the Israelis bombed it. So 
um, it's just an incredibly dangerous place to be working. And because what appears to be a um, deliberate attempt to eliminate the healthcare system as a functioning system, um, it's very hard to work there right now. Um, in terms of triaging after the ceasefire, um, this is like the big question because we don't know what Gaza is gonna look like once the war stops. Um, there are folks who look at what's coming out of the most right-wing Israeli government uh, that say that the goal is to drive everybody into Egypt and to set up refugee camps in the Sinai and you know, wash their hands of these nasty little Palestinians that cause so much trouble. Um, there's that camp. Um, there are people who are talking about uh, from the Israeli government, you know, having the north, northern Gaza be sort of a buffer zone, um, and that the Gazans now have to squish together in the south. Um, and there are people who are talking about, you know, we have to rebuild the institutions and blah, blah, blah. But it's going to be rebuilding from the bottom up because there's been such a massive level of devastation. So I think this is, um, you know, the Israeli government, whatever it whatever its endpoint, doesn't have any impetus or desire or history of fixing what it breaks. They tend to break things and then expect the international community to fix it. So I think that if that is the case, then we're going to have to look to um, our governments, the United Nations, the US, and major organizations like Palestinian Children's Relief Fund and um, and Doctors Without Borders, and, you know, those kind of big organizations that have the capacity to rebuild a healthcare system. Now, after um, the assault in 2014, rebuilding was really, really hard because the Israelis had a policy of denying what they call dual use items, because they said Hamas will use concrete, cement blocks, you know, water pipes, whatever it was to build their tunnels, and they didn't want that to happen, so they wouldn't let that in, and it's very hard to rebuild a system if you don't have concrete. So a lot is gonna depend on what the rules are uh, once this ends. And um, that will then determine how the international community is able to respond because uh, you, know, you have to have the building blocks to be able to build the building. So this is a, a tremendously, tremendously important question. We have no idea. We also have no idea what uh, will happen if the International Criminal Court actually finds Israel guilty of genocide. Um, they have in the past um, <clears throat> said that the separation wall um, is against international law and the Israelis just blew them off and ignored them. So they may just blow them off and ignore them again. Um, there's also uh, a case in, um, I think it's uh, San Francisco, where uh, a group of Palestinians are suing the Biden administration uh, for you know, not uh, for allowing all of this to happen and supporting uh, the Israeli military because these folks have lost family members in Gaza. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of legal things that are going on. We don't know where this is going to fall. Um, and you should also remember that Netanyahu, um, when this war ends, he's out of power. People are very unhappy with him. And he's also about to be indicted and hopefully go to jail. So he is very motivated not to stop this for his own personal skin. And so this is a pretty um, difficult situation because he's also coalitioned with the most right wing um, that, you know, talk about a second Nakba, the Gaza Nakba has been said, and, you know, Gazans are human animals and we're going to, you know, level the place and all sorts of just horrific genocidal language has come out of that wing of the government. And that's his strength. So um, I, I don't know when this is going to stop, how it's going to stop, and what you know, how tragic it's going to look when it does stop. And you also have to remember that stuff is going on in the West Bank at the same time. So it's all part of the same crisis. Although Gaza's really got the major hit of it. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's all a bit overwhelming. But thanks for yeah. articulating that. Dr. Rothschild, my name is Guy Hewlett. I am Hi. the associate dean for the diversity and community affairs here Hello. at CMS. So are you? Nice to meet um, you. Nice to meet you also. I'm an OBGYN as well. Ah. Um, so um, your your story really resonates with me, especially the plight of the other women who are seeking just basic medical care. Um, well, one of the challenges that we are facing at CMSRU is that we have um, an, students who see who span a spectrum of perspectives with regard to this issue. Um, and we have been wrestling with um, ways to support our students 
um, through this um, while maintaining some degree of respect and uh, you know not not tolerating any any hostile or, or belligerent language. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, if there are any words of wisdom you could offer to us <laughs> as we wrestle as we yeah. wrestle with this yeah. this challenge sure. of um, you know get, getting our students um, safely and and through this experience intact. And there's right. students on both sides who are severely affected um, by, by this conflict. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is a conversation that's going on all over the country. So it's not only <laughs> happening here. Um, so I think that the first thing that I always say is um, we need to be respectful and we need to be aware of our fellow citizens um, of, uh, views that might be different than ours and to try to take a deep breath and take it in and not like fall apart when you hear what it is. Um, when I talk to um, students that say that having this conversation makes them feel unsafe because I've been canceled, you know, at some uh, at a residency program because a Jewish resident felt that it would be unsafe for me to present. And when I hear that, it really breaks my heart because I think that there is a difference between being unsafe and uncomfortable. And so, you know, I grew up in a traditional Jewish family, a Zionist family, we loved Israel and we didn't think it could do anything wrong. And I went there when I was 14 and I was just thrilled to be there. And I didn't have any idea that there was something called a Palestinian. I actually had pretty racist views of Arabs, although I didn't know that I did. Um, and so I came from a background where Israel was the promised land and any criticism of Israel was anti-Semitism. And over the course of the years, um, as I became a more politically aware person, as I began to understand colonialism and imperialism and racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and all these kinds of things, I got to understand that the story is a lot more complicated than the one I got as a kid. And so a lot of uh, particularly Jewish students and also Christian Zionist um, students um, are brought up with this idea that Israel is perfect either because it rose out of the ashes of the Holocaust or because all the Jews have to go there so that we can have the apocalypse or whatever your reason is. Um, so they've grown up with a very uncritical view of Israel and thus um, feel very threatened if someone points out that there's some really significant problems going on. And so what I often say is that um, I was talking to uh, a leader in the Jewish community and he said, but you don't understand, Israel is the religion. And what I feel is that Israel is a country, it's not a religion. And we have to make a distinction between a Judaism, the religion, Jews who are a cultural, religious, ethnic, or whatever, all different kinds of definitions group, and the state of Israel. And we can certainly support Jewish people. We can have respect for Judaism and we can have criticisms of the policies of the state of Israel. Now it all gets incredibly complicated because the Israeli government claims that it's the state of the Jewish people. But it's important to remember that, you know, half the Jews don't live in, in Israel and many Jews don't support the policies of Israel and feel that it's a country that we need to improve. If we care about it, we have to make it better and that it's actually been trending in a really dangerous direction. The other thing that I would suggest is that we need to acknowledge the pain and suffering of the Israelis who were attacked by the Hamas attack. And we need to name that attack as a war crime. It is not okay to take hostages, to kill people, to shoot people, to whatever happened, not okay. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to be supportive of Israelis who are suffering from this. And we need to be respectful of the fact that the country um, had sort of, the, the government had put together uh, the idea that, you know, Gaza is under control. They're so beaten down and we attack them every couple of years and they called it mowing the grass. We don't have to worry about those folks. Um, so they had sort of lost track of paying attention and they had their military all on the West Bank and supporting the settlers who are very busy taking land. So they were really caught um, without you know, adequate uh, surveillance. I mean, they actually had the Hamas plans and they doubted that it was gonna happen. And I was in on the Eastern uh, perimeter and actually saw from someone's olive grove um, down the hill, the Hamas training area, and it was right up against the Israeli uh, fence. And so they actually saw Hamas soldiers training, they had the plans, and they thought these folks, they're never gonna do it. So they are deeply humiliated, 
deeply embarrassed. And they're also getting a lot of pushback from the from Israelis who said, "Where? Why weren't you there? What was wrong? Um, why were the military bases so easily overrun? Why did people shelter in their houses and call and no one came?" You know, so we need to remember sort of all the painful dynamics that are going on in Israel and to be sympathetic to that. Um, at the same time, a war crime doesn't justify a genocide. So you know, um, I think that as human beings that we might be able to talk with each other about the fact that it is against international law to bomb hospitals that have patients in them. It doesn't matter who else is in the hospital. If the hospitals have patients in them, you cannot bomb them according to international law. So when you see a country systematically going after every hospital and bombing it, then that's highly problematic. And I don't think it does Israel any good, it does Jewish people any good, it does Palestinians any good to pretend that that's okay. So I think this is gonna involve very painful, difficult conversations. It's gonna involve a lot of honesty and also tolerance of each other's views. And also, as I said, there is a huge difference between feeling challenged and uncomfortable as opposed to feeling endangered. And you know, I think that that's an important take home message because a lot of uh, Jewish people that I know feel endangered by having this conversation. You know, I did um, a documentary film where I um, told the history of Palestine through the voices of Palestinians that I interviewed. And it was so interesting. I showed it at a campus and this one young woman came up to me and she said, I feel endangered when I watch this movie. And I was like, this is a movie presenting people's personal realities and you're so unable to tolerate it. We need to do some work here. You know? So that's a work um, that needs to happen within the Jewish community. And I think the problem is that if you look at mainstream Jewish organizations and the messaging that comes out, because there's a vast, huge messaging industry, propaganda industry, Hasbara industry, um, that frames this in a totally different way, that demonizes Palestinians and that makes any criticism of Israel labeling anti-Semitic, which it is not. Um, and so it, you know, it stirs up all the things that push all the buttons. And so we have to sort of dissect it all and be uh, more honest and respectful with each other. So that's where I would start. It doesn't make it easy. Um, and there are going to be people who can't tolerate this. But you know, I talk to my Palestinian friends who can't stand what they hear from their deans or from their fellow residents who are just oblivious to the fact that you know they just lost 40 of their family members and no one seems to care. So you know, there's a huge amount of suffering going on in here and we need to be respectful of that. I don't know if Thank that's- Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Thank you so much for all of this information, Dr. Rothschild. Um, I was wondering if you could um, speak more about um, the amputations that have taken place. I've like I've been seeing a lot of information about long-term disability and what that means going forward. I know you said in response to the earlier question that it's really hard to know where everything is going to land, but um, I'm wondering if like any more information has come to the surface about how many children and also adults are going to be living with long-term disabilities right. and what can really be done there. Right. So. Um, there has been some data about um, uh, loss of limbs. I saw um, this one article that talked about every day, 10 children lose one or two limbs. Um, so with the tremendous amount of bombing and injuries, there there's a lot of damage to limbs. And the problem is that hospitals aren't equipped to um, uh, save these limbs. And so people often, under the duress of bleeding to death, get amputations, often without anesthesia, by the way. Um, and so this is just a horrendous situation. Um, and also there's the problem of the lack of antibiotics. So many people are then obviously getting infected. So um, there's gonna be a huge amount of physical trauma that people are gonna have to live with. Um, the way that I would compare this is with the March of Return where there were something like 8,000 um, orthopedic injuries, um, mo mostly in young men to their lower extremities. And the problem was that um, there were not enough well high trained orthopedic surgeons. I mean, they had orthopedic surgeons, but not the level that were needed to deal with this level of catastrophe. And so there was a lot of sort of homegrown um, false, you know, pretend legs and crutches and things, but it wasn't up to first world um, uh, standards. So there's gonna be a huge amount of trauma and need and um, a lot of people suffering 
from this. And and I can tell you, having been to Gaza, it's not like, you know, there are streets with sidewalks and all the roads are paved and it's wheelchair accessible. Not like that at all. And it's now completely not like that because the roads have been bombed, the sidewalks have been blown up. You know, just accessibility is going to be an unbelievable crisis, um, even before people didn't have elevators in their homes. Um, so it's it's just, it's going to require a huge amount of aid and assistance and help and people getting treatment outside the strip and all the things you can possibly imagine. And mental health too, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, with that, if there are no more questions, Dr. Rothschild, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to meet with us. Um, we really do appreciate you fitting us into your schedule. And I know it's been a hectic time for you as well, trying to educate as best as you can. So thank you for your efforts. Um, can we talk about what things people can do? Please. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to leave everybody, you know, suicidally depressed here. Um, yeah. So I'm not good for your mental health. Okay. Um, so I think that um, as U.S. citizens and as healthcare professionals, uh, we do have a particular role and we do have a particular credibility. So I think the first thing that you need to do is to be educated. And that means not only getting your news from social media or from the New York Times or from sites that may or may not be accurate, um, that I think you need to delve a little deeper, look at what the UN is putting out, look at what different NGOs are putting out. Um, I think uh, Manda Weiss and Electronic Intifada are very, and Al Jazeera are very good sources of information. So you need to know what's going on um, because if you're talking to people, you gotta have the data. Um, and um, the other thing is beyond educating yourself, then you have a responsibility to educate your friends and your community as best you can. Um, because you're in the medical profession, as you move up the level, you will get more credibility just for having survived medical school. So people are willing to listen to you uh, because of your medical expertise. Um, as citizens of this country um, that is basically funding this war, um, I think we have a tremendous responsibility to push our elected officials to change. And this um, often feels like a major headbanging experience, um, but we still have to do it. So even if you're a very, very busy medical student and you have exams and everything's crazy, um, you can take five minutes every day and write to your representative and your congressman and be sure you put in a piece of data and suggest that a ceasefire now is absolutely needed. And just a little bit, so they know you're out there, you're, you care about this, you have the information, and you're pushing them to move. And um, you know it's something we have to do. Um, if you have time, there are uh, lots of demonstrations and protests that are going on. You know, Healthcare Workers for Palestine is organizing a lot. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace is organizing a lot. And I know other groups are as well. And I think when you're uh, doing a demonstration, wear your white coat, make it clear that you are a medical person and that you have um, concern for the healthcare of Palestinians. Um, the thing that I found, uh, I got involved in um, doing this uh, because when I began to educate myself about uh, the history of basically settler colonialism, which I didn't even have a word for at that point, um, no one wanted to hear from me. Our group, we were trying to put out community events and we were just blacklisted. This was in Boston. And then we decided we would um, look at the whole area through the lens of healthcare and human rights, because um, we understood that while people might think that Israel can do no wrong, they would not support the idea that women deliver at checkpoints, <clears throat> that there's some basic level of humanity that we could all agree on. So I think it's often um, very effective to talk as a healthcare human rights kind of person who looks at a devastating situation and asks, why did this happen? How can we stop it? And what can we do to change it? 
And so you can use your um, your lens of being a healthcare person um, to have that kind of conversation because it can be very powerful. And um, you just you're in a different place than someone who's just you know outraged. Um, you have a um, a ground that you can stand on, and and the particular you know people are uh, will you know just looking at uh, NICU babies you know clustered together trying to keep each other warm wakes people up and then they ask well, why that happened and what happened at Shifa Hospital and <laughs> all those kind of questions. And that gives you an opportunity to talk more about the background. And I think that you have to be, um, you shouldn't excuse things that militants have done, but you can't um, accuse militants of terrorism and not accuse the Israeli army of committing war crimes. So I think you have to really uh, keep your, your balance. Um, when you're speaking and your center um, in human rights for everyone. Um, and after that, I think it's uh, really important if you have time um, to look at what's happening in the media and I'm losing my voice one second. Um, <clears throat> because there's a lot um, in the media that is totally inaccurate or inaccurately framed or um, framed with an assumption that you don't agree with. And so writing letters to the editor, you know, 100 words, 200 words, quick as a bunny, um, when you see something that you don't think is framed appropriately, or when you hear something on media that is not framed in a way that you think reflects reality is useful. If, you know, some newspaper gets, you know, 50 letters saying X, Y, Z, they're gonna pay attention. They, they won't publish, necessarily publish your letter, but they'll pay attention. And I think that, I have a long view of this because I've been doing this since the 90s. Um, and in the 90s, we couldn't use the word Palestine. That was considered too wildly crazy. Um, and we couldn't use the word apartheid, even though uh, Jimmy Carter came out with his book, Peace Not Apartheid. So the language and the framing has changed so much over the decades that I do believe that all of this work um, has power. now. It has not had enough power to prevent this current catastrophe, um, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying. Um, and it's also so dangerous for the region and for us, you know, um, as the funders of this. So um, those are some things that I would ask you to think about uh, doing. Um, and the idea of doing medical missions and stuff, you really need to have a skill set to be able to do that. And things have to not be in the catastrophic state that they are um, currently. So. That actually inspired a few more private questions that came in. So I'll ask them. Um, one student asked, what is the responsibility of the medical community as a whole, especially with regards to a stance of medical neutrality? Um, and how do we kind of wrestle with that? Well, it's interesting because I just had an op-ed published on that. Um, if you look up Seattle Times with my last name, uh, you will see an op-ed. Um, so my feeling is that the medical community has a responsibility to speak out about what is going on. And one of the interesting things is that when uh, the occupation of Ukraine happened, all sorts of professional organizations were up in arms and wrote you know, letters and made a big fuss about the occupation of Ukraine by Russia. Most, the only uh, medical, um, professional medical organization that has clearly spoken out in the US is uh, American Public Health Association. You know, ACOG has not mentioned anything about the devastation of pregnant women. Um, the Pediatric Academy uh, has not mentioned anything about all, you know, two thirds of the uh, mortality is women and children. You know, orthopedic surgeons have not said anything about the level of orthopedic amputations and all that stuff. So I feel like the silence of the medical profession is, first of all, a reflection of our own racism and uh, fear and um, inability to. Uh, honor what we have been trained to do um, and that we need to pressure our medical organizations to speak out because we have some authority as healthcare providers um, and it is our responsibility to do that. Um, and so I think that's another work to do. I mean, I don't know if AMSA ever talks about this or I don't know what medical association students have now, but in whatever association you're in, I think it would be incredibly powerful um, to uh, try to get the organization to move forward and to say something uh, because that has power and that changes people's minds. So Dr. Rashev, if I can um, piggyback on your last um, comments, um, 
you know, I, I think many many institutions, I suspect, are reticent to comment on this issue because of the experience that they, we just witnessed with um, Harvard and Penn and um, MIT also mm -hmm. um, was kind of dragging right. the carpet in front of Congress. Right. Um, so uh, there, there are potential serious repercussions for institutions. And I suspect that leadership is um, being circumspect in their response to this. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you balance those competing priorities? Right. So first of all, this is totally difficult and I don't have an answer. Um, you know, and it's interesting because I was at the, um, in Philadelphia, the Palestine Rights Literature Festival, which this president, the president of UPenn got creamed for and, you know, accused of having dangerous, I don't know what we were, terrorists on campus or whatever. And that was the most um, incredible cultural literary festival that I've ever been to. It was full of all sorts of creative people and, you know, the way that it was discussed in the newspaper, I didn't recognize it. So it shows to me uh, that there is a fairly organized right-wing um, plan to uh, attack people who do anything supportive of Palestine or try to be balanced in any kind of way. And that this is really um, squeezing uh, cultural institutions and universities. Um, on the other hand, if everybody uh, is terrified of what's gonna happen and keeps their mouth shut, then they've succeeded. And so the question is, is there a way that organizations could support each other, could challenge this kind of um, uh, censoring? Um, this is what we need to talk about amongst ourselves. It's not easy, and it, I can imagine it is terrifying for institutions. Um, and I certainly have colleagues who have been doxxed, who've lost their jobs, who have been accused of being anti-Semites, just horrific, horrific things. Um, and all they did was say, you know, I'm concerned about the children dying in Gaza. So we're living in a very dangerous place right now. Um, but we have to figure out how to have a moral stance. And so that's a, a conversation that each institution has to have. And if we had it together, I think we'd be more powerful than if each you know silo of institutions is fretting about their donors and worried about being attacked as anti-Semites and you know buying into this idea that um, supporting Palestinians uh, who are being severely injured and traumatized is somehow um, anti-Semitic or, you know, you can't uh, believe in the state of Israel if you support Palestinian health or whatever the charge is. So it's a, it's a very difficult issue, but I think just being quiet is just gonna allow the right-wing censoring type of people to be in power and to take over and to control the narrative. And the narrative is very important. Um, so, you know, someone like me who is no longer employed feels like I can do this because you can't fire me because no one's hired me. Um, but, you know, if I get doxxed, it will be really, really annoying. Um, on the other hand, I think that institutions really need to sort of look into their souls and look into their missions and to see if together uh, there could be a way out of this because it's really, really destructive. And it's destructive to education and free speech and justice and all sorts of issues that are incredibly important to us. So it's a serious conversation and I completely understand what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Um, one student also privately asked and said that um, we have been explicitly told in the past by school administration to not wear our white coats or anything that is has sort of the school logo on it at a, as a, at a protest. Um, and you mentioned that we should do that. Do you have any advice for how to like circumvent that portion? Because there is an authority that comes with having this. Right, right. No, no, I understand. If they tell you not to wear your white coats with the hospital logo, you should not wear your white coats with the hospital logo. Um, could you put tape over your hospital logo? I mean, could you have just a generic white coat or put a stethoscope around your neck or something that identifies you as a healthcare person? Um, you know, because demonstrations are part politics and part theater. Um, and it's important for people to self-identify where they're coming from. So, you know, I would obviously respect uh, what the school says. Um, you don't want to be thrown out of school. You don't want to lose your career. Um, you have to be very strategic in what you choose to do. And something I always advise people, be very, very careful what you put on social media. I mean, I um, supported a young man who um, 
uh, had been accepted into a residency program. I mean, he worked in a Jewish hospital. He was not an anti-Semite. He grew up in New Jersey, you know. Uh, but when he was 14 and Israel was bombing his relatives in Gaza, he had one social media post that was a rant against Israel. And based on that one post, he lost his residency, you know, years later. Um, and it took a year in courts and a huge amount of angst and money and suffering to get the residency program back. So be incredibly careful about what you put on social media. Anything you put, imagine someone um, in a residency committee looking at that when they're trying to decide if you should come to their residency. Think, in, think big, you know, um, and do not do anything impulsively or ranting or um, anything that you could possibly regret um, at another time. Um, so I feel like what we can do on social media is say things factually. Such and such number of people have died. Two thirds of them are women and children. I'm devastated and concerned about this. You know, that's a factual piece of information. Um, and to prove that you're an anti-Semite because you said that would be challenging. I'm sure someone would try to do it. But you gotta really um, pick your battles and be very, very careful on tweeting and Facebook and all those kinds of things because um, it can really get you into trouble uh, later on in life. Um, one student asked if you could share more about delivering at checkpoints and also what it means to operate in a hospital with no electricity. Okay, so just the last question first. Um, in Gaza, um, there is no electricity coming in. Um, and so uh, the hospitals rely on uh, generators that run on fuel. Um, and that's a pretty dicey thing. And they are sometimes operating and electricity goes out. Um, and so um, doctors have been known to operate using their cell phone uh, lights. Um, you know, someone holds the lights over the body and they do the best that they can to operate. Um, clearly this is not the optimal way to operate, but they use whatever they can to light the OR. Um, and you can imagine then you can't use any of the electrical based equipment that you operate with either. So it's it's sub suboptimal. Um, in terms of delivering at checkpoints, um, Gaza no longer has internal checkpoints. It used to have two checkpoints and then the checkpoint to get in and out. Um, it's the West Bank that has the hundreds of checkpoints. And depending on the week, um, checkpoints can be uh, manned or womaned um, or personed um, or not. And so to get from point A to point B, you have to first of all know are the checkpoints open or closed today? Are, are they, do they have soldiers at them or can you just drive through? Um, and you have to have a permit for yourself and for your car. Um, and so um, it can make uh, travel and access. And you have to have, you know, if you have a license plate that has Israeli plates, you can get through, but you can't have a license plate with Israeli plates unless you have connections and someone in East Jerusalem gave you their card. You know, there are all sorts of ways that people get around this, but basically uh, you have to pay attention to the checkpoint system and what's happening. Now, um, the UN um, and uh, the UN, it's UNFPA, Family Population, I don't know, Association, something that's UNFPA, um, did a study where they documented that there were women in labor who would get trapped at checkpoints and the soldiers wouldn't let them through. And they would say, you're just fat, go back home or some horrible thing. And that's women uh, actually delivered at checkpoints and bled to death at checkpoints, died at checkpoints, lived, but their baby died. All sorts of horrific things happen. And so um, this is a documented thing that the UN has shown happened. Um, I don't have any current data on that, um, but it is certainly something that women who are pregnant in the West Bank fear is their ability to get to the healthcare facility um, in one piece um, and to deliver in the appropriate place. Um, in Gaza, the problem with getting to a healthcare facility is that there aren't a whole lot of them left. They don't have much services. People can get killed just driving to the hospital. Um, so that the fear about getting care is multiplied by all the other variables that are going on, but it's not checkpoints because uh, Gaza, once the, um, Jewish settlers were pulled out in 2005. Uh, the internal checkpoints were removed. And in fact, the Israeli government said, we're not occupying anymore. They're on their own, but they clearly were occupying because they controlled the land, the sea, the water, the electricity, and everything that went in and out. So, you know, it's important to think about what the language means and what this, to, to be sure the framework is a framework that you think is honest. 
Thank you. Last call for questions. I don't see any more in the chat. I think those were all the ones that came in. So if people want to know more, I have a website, um, alicerothchild.com, because um, I've, I've been on Democracy Now!, I've done a lot of talks, I've written a lot. Um, you know, if you want to have a sort of general sense of healthcare under occupation, I do recommend my book, Condition Critical. I also just had published uh, this year and last year uh, books for middle grade and young adult. So I have some fun novels about Palestine that are will give people a sense of what's going on. So there's a lot of information on my website um, if people are interested in more. I just put in the chat for anyone who's curious. Oh, what's this? Um, I put your, your website in the, in the chat. Oh, great, okay. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions, I won't take up any more of Dr. Rothschild's time or your time. Um, the attendance is in the chat, so if you haven't had a chance to put in your name, please do that so you can get credit. Um, I'll stop recording now.